Tēnā tātou, tēnā tātou ko hui hui mai nei i tēnei ahiahi, tēnei te mihi atu ki a kaitau, ko hiri aroha tēnei mihi atu ana. Ka tīmata tātou tēnei huinga i te karakia. Mai e te tupua, mai e te tawhito, mai e te kāhui o ngā riki, mai e te kāhui o ngā tanipa. Tā whiwhi atu ki ngā tua ko rangi nui ki runga, ko papa tua nuk i ki runga. Kau pare atu ngā kino o te wā, kau pare atu ngā poke o te wā. Kia o whakawātei te aratoka tū a o tāne e whakapiripiri. Tēnei te pau o te pānaku, tēnei te pau o te pārangi. Kā whakamau ki tai, kā whakamau ki te tūturu, whakamau a kia tina, haumi e hui e tāki. Tēnā tātou and welcome to our first webinar series for He Waka e Kenoa. So some quick housekeeping. Um, just if you have any questions, uh, you can ask those at the end of the presentation by Professor Professor Linda Tuhiwai Smith, um, and you can write those in the chat. Uh, so I'm going to pass it over to Professor Leone Pihima to, to take us through the first webinar. Tēnā tātou. Uh, tēnā tātou. Uh, tūtahi mihi tēnei ki a koe, uh, hiri a ohana i whakatūwhira tō tātou uh, hui, uh, uh, ipurangi nei, tēnā koe, tēnā koe, tēnā koe. Uh, huri ki te uh, nga tāngato, ko tāi mai, ko um, kuhu mai ki rotu i tēnei uh, pari, uh, tēnā koutou. Uh, tēnā koutou rongi nga āhotanga o te wā, ko te tūmana, ko kei te noho haumaru, kei te noho ora koutou, kato i tēnei wā, uh, nō reira uh, tēnā koutou. Um, Welcome everyone. Welcome everyone to this first um, online webinar from the He Waka Eke Noa team. And, and I just want to really acknowledge the time that we're in first and foremost in terms of um, COVID and, and the many stresses and strains that people have felt over the past couple of years uh, and just wish us all well-being. I know there are a number of whanau uh, that are currently in isolation and uh, have contracted, particularly the Omicron um, yeah, version of the of COVID at the moment. So just sending out uh, best wishes to all of you and all of us and all of our whānau, uh, both in Aotearoa and uh, across the globe. So what we wanted to do uh, um, over the next uh, few months is to bring um, a series of presentations from a project called He Waka Ike Noa. And He Waka Ike Noa is a project that's been funded through an Endeavour Fund with MB. Um, and it's a co-designed kaupapa co Māori project that's been driven by a range of Māori uh, researchers and Māori um, social service practitioners and healers. Uh, in particular. So I wanted to do a little bit of an overview of the project and then uh, pass you on to um, the distinguished professor, Linda Smith, uh, to give a presentation um, on one of the projects that kind of brought us into this space. So Hewaka Eke Noa um, is a kaupapa Māori uh, driven project that's investigating the role of cultural frameworks, Māori cultural frameworks, in terms of strengthening, strengthening whānau and uh, contributing to the wider work around um, family and sexual violence uh, prevention and intervention that have been done particularly um, by Māori social service providers around the motu. And we've been fortunate to be working with Te Puna Oranga uh, from Te Waipaunamu and to Te Mwahini o Taranaki uh, in this mahi. So what we've been doing uh, in the project, um, we're going to present over the next series of webinars, uh, looking both at kind of whakawhiti kōrero, qualitative uh, kōrero around tikanga, around mātauranga Māori, around kaupapa Māori, and the kind of elements and factors that our whānau, hapu iwi, and Māori organisations and healers have been talking about make a contribution to um, family and sexual violence prevention and intervention. So it is grounded in kaupapa Māori um, practice, kaupapa Māori theory, kaupapa Māori methodologies. The term he waka e ke noa, I know this is a whakatauki that is, is actually used quite often in a whole range of contexts. Um, we chose to use this particular uh, whakatauki in the context of collective responsibility and collective obligation to move forward uh, and to continue to be progressing and moving uh, toward well-being. So we know 
that uh, within this whakataiki that it literally means to move a waka uh, and to move that board. So it is an apt uh, whakataiki for us as Māori and for Indigenous people when we're talking about collective responsibility uh, in terms of well-being, not just in terms of family violence prevention, but just well-being uh, more generally. And I think that COVID has really shown us that a lot of our people are really coming together back in Bano and Fanongatanga ways, uh, collective ways, to seek well-being. One of the projects that informed the development of this project uh, was one called He Oranga Ngākau, which was Māori views and Māori understandings of, of what had been called trauma-informed care. And that project, we worked with a number of Māori providers and practitioners who then talked about a need to move forward uh, from not only the kind of trauma focus, but to move forward in terms of the kind of indigenizing Māori tikanga focus around healing. But today we want to, um, today Linda's going to share with you some of the discussions and some of the findings from He Ōdanga Ngākau, Māori understandings of trauma-informed care, because it was through this project, through that project, that we began to think about kaupapa Māori elements that sit within um, the wider well-being drive that Māori practitioners were talking about. Now, I know that uh, Linda doesn't require a huge introduction. Many of you are very familiar with her work, in particular her seminal publication, Decolonizing Methodologies, which is now in its third edition and has also been translated into a number of uh, languages internationally. It is a publication that really changed the face of Māori and Indigenous engagement in the research space, which was tradition, you know, has historically been a colonizing space, uh, and in many contexts continues to be that. So decolonizing methodologies really moved a frame to where we as Māori and Indigenous scholars, communities, you know, practitioners could begin to think about methodologies in a way that align to our tikanga and mātauranga Māori. You know that Linda hails from, um, from Ngāti Awa, from Ngāti Plo, and from Tūhaurangi, and is currently a distinguished professor at Te Whare Wānanga or Awanui Ārangi, so returning to her iwi, her iwi foundations in terms of Wānanga and Mahi. So given that, I want to hand it over to Linda. Um, and if you have any questions during the presentation, please, uh, if possible, just put them into the Q&A function. And during the session, I'll take note of those questions and then we'll have a conversation with Linda uh, for about 20 minutes at the end of the presentation. Uh, uh, Linda, thank you for the introduction and welcome everyone uh, to the, the first of these series of uh, webinars. It's a bit of an adventure for our team. So I just want to acknowledge uh, those who work behind the scenes as always uh, to um, help us communicate well to you. Uh, as Leone said, uh, he waka e kenoa has been informed really by a pro large program of research carried out by some teams of Māori researchers uh, over, you know, the last 20 years, really. And what I'm going to uh, talk about are some of the learnings from one particular project called He Oranga Ngāko uh, that we take into He Waka Eke Noa. And I really want to kind of reinforce the linkages of all the pieces of work that uh, we and others have done. Because 20 years ago, there was no real recognition of you know, intergenerational trauma or trauma from colonization. There is no uh, recognition of uh, healing processes that are required uh, to address historical uh, trauma. So 
you know, much of the team who have worked in, um, in these uh, projects have been really providing the research platform uh, that is enabling us to talk today about, you know, trauma. And why do I say that? Because actually a lot of people just think Māori should get over things, uh, that, you know, you just bury it and move on, that you get on with life and you just, um, you know, put all your sorrows away and you man up or you, you mana up and you just get on with life. There's a great deal of research across the world that shows that trauma um, is not something you just get over. And it can uh, be reproduced and passed down through generations. It alters practices. It alters feelings and emotions. It alters identities. It alters our um, relationships and it alters our physical bodies and has a huge impact on our sense of well-being, our sense of place, um, our sense of worthiness, our value, our sense of being settled. Um, all those things, I think, you know, trauma has this huge impact. And as you know, in the literature, um, uh, say in the US, uh, Bonnie Duran and Eduardo Duran have kind of introduced the notion of soul wound. Because what we're talking about is not just sort of physical um, trauma. You know, it's not like being injured and breaking your leg um, or being in a traffic accident. Now, the one of the reasons here Oranga Ngako um, started as a project is um, Leonie and others, our providers, uh, Ngaropi Cameron, Arihi Tanana, and Hinuirangi Kohu Morgan, uh, the late Tanya Mataki, who are all working in these spaces, were being asked to really apply what's called a trauma informed care model into their practice. And you know, while I think Māori get quite excited thinking, oh, yes, this is for us. In reality, the trauma-informed care model came to us via the UK, the US, North America, Australia, who are all using uh, trauma-informed care as a way to treat a very individualised notion of what trauma is. So our project really was looking at a kaupapa Māori approach to um, our ideas of trauma and to look at how these could influence practices, the practices that our providers um, use, the practices that clinicians or practitioners use, uh, but also policy to kind of influence the way Kopapa Māori is viewed uh, in government and really trying to draw out, you know, many of the aspects of Kopapa Māori that um, people either misunderstand, they don't get, you know, they see one layer of it, they don't really see its application across a wide range of um, Kopapa. And, you know, I mean, the risk for us is they begin to interpret Kopapa Māori in a kind of narrow and, for lack of a, um, a better word, a kind of inauthentic way that loses its power and that actually can, can take power away uh, from the very communities uh, with whom we work. So... What I'm showing here really is the report that came out of He Oranga Ngāko. Uh, I think we put a great deal of work in trying to spell out uh, Māori and Indigenous approaches to trauma, because it's not like we've come late to the game. Our healers, our practitioners 
have been, you know, have deep philosophies and practices for healing trauma, not for treating trauma um, or providing therapies necessarily uh, for trauma, but have a philosophy around healing and what that might mean. So why is that important, the healing piece of it? Um, it's one, it, to me, it's one of the missing aspects politically uh, in Aotearoa in terms of our treaty settlement processes, in terms of decolonizing methodologies. Healing is a really important um, process. We've tended to ignore it in our treaty settlements, like you don't really hear in any settlement a strategy for healing or a space and a resourcing of healing because our treaty settlements are a particular kind of settlement. I call them neoliberal settlements. And we've missed out two significant components in the package of elements that form a settlement. One of them is called reconciliation and the other one is called healing. So other countries like Australia, Canada, the US maybe, uh, you know, that's their first line is reconciliation and healing. And there is a lot of critique about that on its own. Um, we in Aotearoa went down another pathway and in that process, politically, I'm talking about, we lost sight, I think, of the healing component and the reconciliation component. So they, they still sit on the table as unfinished uh, business as far as I'm concerned. So just to kind of uh, provide some very brief, uh, simple statements about Hill he Oranga Ngako. Uh, like much of our recent research, uh, working with Leone, who was the principal investigator, it has been this collaboration and co design uh, with some um, significant Māori providers. And I just want to pay you know, my respects and homage to the late Tanya Mataki, um, who did not live to see the, our report and the completion of our project, uh, but whose organization, uh, He Puna Ora, I think, let me get it all right, uh, Te Puna Oranga in Christchurch, you know, has been such an important part of this. I want to acknowledge Ngarupi Cameron, Tutama Wahine, and her Fano and um, that organization, Hinewirangi Kohu Morgan, who formed, who was such a kind of critical part of our methodologies, Rihi Tenana, Hiri Aroha Skipper, and um, Leonie and I, that was our team, it was a really cool team. And um, it, was, it was a great pleasure uh, to do research with them. So I want to move now to the next slide, please. And just a remind uh, people of the Kaupapa Māori principles that informs our work. It informs all our work, all our practices, the way we think about things uh, as Kaupapa Māori researchers. And the core principles really, um, you know, Graham Smith wrote about more than what two decades ago almost, um, you know, these principles have been around a long time, but they've also grown and expanded and developed. So you will see in there the principal ata, uh, which is a contribution of uh, Taina Pohatu and the work that he has done. So, you know, why, why Kaupapa Māori in the sort of research we do and what does Kopapa Māori have to do with trauma-informed care? And you know, what does it contribute then to healing practices? 
I mean, I see kaupapa Māori as more than just a theory of doing research. It's a kaupapa for doing. It's a kaupapa for living. It's a kaupapa for being. It's a way of thinking about things. It's a way of framing what might be a particular um, challenge or problem or issue or concern or observation. Um, but then it is also a way of thinking through what do we do about it. And the part that many people miss out, I mean, no, let me just step back a bit. So um, many people know kaupapa Māori uh, by the idea of by Māori, for Māori, with Māori, governed by Māori, framed by Māori, designed by Māori, with Māori, and for Māori. And so that's a kind of shorthand way um, of thinking about kaupapa Māori. The part that many people miss out often or don't spend much, much time thinking about is the solutions end of what it is we're trying to do. So kaupapa Māori is not really about trying to describe, I think Graham talks about it as trying to describe our wounds, our haki haki, our sores, because there's a great deal of research that already does that. It already describes all the issues we have, all the problems, you know, that kind of uh, research, which is proven to be overwhelmingly unhelpful because embedded in that kind of research is no theory of a solution, no theory of a transformation, no theory of a redress. And I think what Kopapa Māori has this commitment to, you know, in the concept of Kopapa, in the concept of Tinoranga Tiratanga, in the concept of Ako, in the concept of Kapikiake Inga Raru Raru o Tikainga, in the concept of Ata, concept of Kopapa, concept of Tonga Tukuiho, concept of Fano, embedded in those is this kind of idea that that's where the solutions are, that's where the strengths are, that's where we need to look for the answers. Not out there in, you know, other wonderlands of research, but look to our worlds because our people, you know, have been experts in many of these areas and they have the philosophy that helps us drive um, towards solutions. So, you know, does that mean we just drop all that research from the past and we kind of take for granted the way they've defined the problem? No, you know, much of what we have to do first is, is revisit all that research and reframe, you know, much of it in terms of what it means. How is it still relevant? Is it is it like completely off? And we've found uh, working with other indigenous researchers internationally, uh, really helpful in this space. And in this project and some of our others, uh, we've worked particularly with a group at the University of Washington, uh, Karina Walters, who you know, many of you will, I'm sure, know her work. Uh, Michelle Johnson Jennings, um, and a team of researchers there who've been doing similar sorts of work and have, um, I guess, a shared vision of what we're trying to address. So these are the Kaupapa Māori principles. And I think what we've done in Heoranga Ngāko is, if you like, put another layer behind these principles and ask the question, when we're thinking about healing from intergenerational trauma, how do these principles apply? What is it that they teach us? But also what is it our participants have told us both through interviews and for 
and for a number of regional hui that we um, conducted that um, provide us with ways forward and provides us with some maybe um, more applied kaupapa Māori principles for this particular um, context of healing from intergenerational or healing from trauma, if I put it like that. So if I can move to the next slide, please. Um, you will note, firstly, that these are circular. And I'm not sure if you can see me, but I can't see you. But I'll just hold these up. So these are some resources that have come out of her Oranga Nako. And this is the flip side then. And uh, one of the things you see at the top is the idea of kāti te patu ngāko. And really, he oranga ngāko is the, the vision of well-being, the well-being of our ngāko Māori. That, you know, that that framing um, of trauma or reframing of trauma in terms of patu ngāko, the blows to our ngāko, our ngāko Māori. Um, you know, that's the trauma. And so the healing part of it is kind of strengthening, enhancing, rebuilding he oranga ngāko. So just some um, simple, this is uh, a little bit of a summary, and I've got another slide that goes into more detail. But for example, here are some um, little principles that we think are important. They, For those of you listening or watching who are in the trauma-informed care space, you would know they're already practice principles. Um, we we knew what those principles were and have actually expanded on many of them. You know, so the first principle, for example, is stop, stop the trauma. Um, and so we've sort of interpreted that as stop the blows to the ngāko, so the ngāko can begin to heal. That that's where the healing has to take place. It's not a Band-Aid that you stick on a saw on the surface um, of the human person on the on the you know outside skin part. It has to be the healing is within and it has to be healed holistically. Um, it's important to support sort of this strategy as a kind of intergenerational and a long-term healing. And for, for the, just what I've said, it's not a Band-Aid approach. And I guess our critique um, in the project of the trauma-informed care approach is it's very contained. It has good intentions, but is quite individualistic, contained, constrained, um, and it's not really dealing with not even one generation. It does not deal with a Fano. It's an individualized therapy option. And that's a significant problem for us. Um, some other kind of principles about acknowledging the pain our people feel. You know, there's often, um, it's minimized that pain. Uh, people, uh, don't spend a lot of time trying to facilitate someone really communi communicating that pain. And so what we're good at doing here in Aotearoa is dismissing it, ignoring it, uh, making fun of it, or reducing it. Right, so we minimize it. And uh, so people in pain, you know, they learn shorthand. It's like, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. Well, they're not. And it's a language that's needed to talk about pain, but it's also a space. It's also a way of being able to express emotions and hurt, a mamai, uh, tears, upe, 
all those things that we know in our culture, uh, you know, are good, healthy practices, actually. And yet they're often, uh, you know, seen as inappropriate or too much. So acknowledging pain is not, you know, once again, this is not a superficial issue. Is to acknowledge, recognize the pain, help someone sit with the pain, express the pain, and and in a sense honor, you know, the depth of that pain and and the person who's who's had to bear that pain. Help people build their own uh, fare or support so they have shelter. I find this quite an important one. Because, you know, many people have this idea that um, they get better and they can go home. They can go back to their whānau, all right? Well, sometimes they've harmed their whānau so much themselves that their whānau don't want them back. Sometimes putting them back into their whānau just puts them back into a uh, risky and toxic environment. Sometimes their whānau are scattered, hurt and hurt and in pain, just like them. And they, they have no shelter, like literally no shelter. And so many of the clients, I guess, in, in our organizations need as one of those first orders of what do human beings need, shelter. And then they need the opportunity to build support systems. But they won't be that romantic idea of Fano. Okay? They have to build, rebuild a Fano. And it may not be a whakapapa Fano. It might be the Fano that have chosen to, to hang with them and they've chosen to be with them. That might be where they get their most fundamental support from. And that, that doesn't make them less Māori. You know, so it's about using Māori processes to keep Māori in, in our processes. And, but also recognising that, you know, actually many of our traditional processes did have explicit strategies for excluding people for exiling them or people exile themselves so i just think fano is not the ultimate answer for every problem because our fano are also um, many of them in stress i think a big one in terms of this principle of rangatiratanga is um, just the sheer support for kaupapa Māori approaches and practices that are needed. There's a kind of lip surface support, um, but actually it's not resourced. So people can say, yes, we support kaupapa Māori services, but they really don't. They throw them crumbs. And also they don't really understand what kaupapa Māori approaches in our providers looks like. They fund them. I always describe it like this. You, you fund the trauma-informed care package. Um, you pay them so many dollars for so many hours. They go through the process. Then it's done. They're healed. Right? But it's an individual process. Whereas most Copa Māori organizations, whether they're paid to or not, provide this whole Fano wraparound service. They seek to support the Fano. They go way beyond just this kind of individual um, time bound and constrained treatment model. And, you know, search kind of intuitively in some ways for ways to heal, for, for strategies that can help a person heal. And then the fourth one in there is the kind of just honor Māori aspirations for self-determination, because we see that all the time, you know, in our communities and our grassroots organizations, 
our kaupapa Māori providers that if they were honoured for the work they do, uh, if they were supported for the work they do, they would be so much more fabulous than what they are now. They would be even more successful because they would have more self-determining um, capability to do the work of kaupapa Māori and healing. So I've got to just move to the last slide. I know there's some questions coming through. So I just want to finish. Um, this takes those previous uh, points I was talking to and which are in here uh, in this slide, but alongside a whole lot of other um, principles that came out of our study. So I just want to pick a few out. So remember, it's about, um, you know, people, clients, we call them clients, whānau, who've been traumatised and who are working towards uh, healing and being supported to do that by kaupapa Māori providers. Uh, many of them find this a long journey and they often have a lot of experience with non-Māori providers. Um, who don't really heal or even support um, the journey that they need to go on. So it is a journey. It's really important uh, for many of those clients that they have a sense of control over how professionals and practitioners work with them. And it's expressed very simply in, in control, for example, over their case files. And so one of our principles is that, you know, case files should be really co-constructed uh, with them, with, with clients, so that they can have better control over the way their journey is being narrated. So they can control the way their story is being told by others, because Clinical notes carry on and, you know, complete strangers pick those notes up and those are the ways they then interact with that person. Uh, but that person has had no control over the story. And in fact, much of it has been misinterpreted. You know, another aspect is around helping them mourn and farewell the trauma, right? It's, it's not like you just close the door, move on, goodbye. Um, it's also acknowledging in, you know, I guess some people would say through ceremony, through ritual, through karakia, um, through some kind of public acknowledgement that someone has in a position where they can put it aside, it's there. It's not like it's forgotten. They can see it, but they've made some choices about the healing journey that they're on. So there's several principles in here. I don't have time because I know we've got questions flying around. And, um, and so all of these ideas have then, you know, gone into the way we, um, have designed the He Waka Eke Noa um, project. And it's, you know, our understandings, I guess, of what many of our whānau and our people confront. It doesn't really mat what matter in a sense what the issues are. Um, deeply at the core of them are these principles that underlie uh, not only the way we analyze the problems, but the way we design and understand the solutions. So I'll finish there and um, look forward to your questions. Uh, kia ora, Linda. Um, tēnā nō tato. So we've had a we've had a couple of questions come through the um, through the Q and A and a, a couple of comments. So one of them uh, 
comes from Lee. And Lee's asking if you could please touch on some of the other political factors that have been focused on in Aotearoa uh, rather than reconciliation and healing. So I guess it's going back to your discussion around the treaty settlement process. Yeah. Uh, and so, um, yeah. Well, the big focus of the treaty settlement process, I, you know, one of the reasons I, I refer to it as a neoliberal settlement process is, is it came out of those neoliberal reforms uh, in the late 1980s, early 1990s. So a core part of the treaty settlement process has been around economic um, development and you know, the idea of a full and final settlement, especially in the historical uh, spaces, the, the fact that there was this significant cross-party commitment to do the settlements by a certain time and within what was called the fiscal envelope uh, was a big shaper of, you know, what settlements would look like that they would have a compensatory uh, component, um, that the iwi would have the means, the commercial means uh, to get into economic development. There would be an acknowledgement of the history of grievance, the, the you know, recognition by the Crown. So it's constructed in a particular way, but you can see from you know, post-settlement entities that been divided into corporate components of post-settlement uh, iwi organisations and the social, cultural investment components as if they were at odds with each other. Um, and, you know, in some of the post-government settlement entities, they were two separate organisations and everybody talked about benefits flowing to the iwi, but it was constructed in a way that that couldn't happen um, because the iwi was given a small amount of money by which they had to make a lot of money in order to do some of the investments. And that's a long, long strategy. So sorry, that's a real quick summary. There's a lot of nuances I know in treaty settlements and iwi who have negotiated them have been amazingly creative. However, very few of them have negotiated or acknowledged healing strategies, reconciliation strategies. You know, the Crown saying sorry is not a reconciliation strategy, that's called an apology. Um, the reconciliation processes are long processes as well. You've got to understand what's been reconciled. Healing is not what the Crown does to Māori. Healing is the resources that Māori get to be able to develop healing strategies, processes, bring healing back into our oranga, our way of living and our understandings of well-being. So that's, sorry, a quick summary, as fast as I could. Oh, and I mean, that links us to, you know, if we understand the fiscal envelope in the 90s, the way in which that was framed to, um, you know, limit and restrict our capacity to engage in um, you know, meaningful honouring of Te Tiri Tiri Waitangi, and in many ways to kind of dull down the movement uh, for Tinalunga Tiritanga of the time, which is kind of an ongoing strategy by the successive governments, by the Crown. Um, I just want to move to, there are a number of Pātai actually that have come through quite a lot now, um, uh, to Vicky Thorn, uh, Tina Kui Ngā Tikuia. Uh, and so Vicky asks, in the health reforms and the new Māori Health Authority, and the IMPB, the Iwi Māori Partnership Boards, what would be your recommendation to how transformative change to these principles can be incorporated? And fortunately, you're a part of the tribunal that also did the whole of the report. So I guess it's kind of what are your ideas around how some of these principles can be incorporated in meaningful ways in terms of these structural changes that we're currently seeing? Well, I think what are the principles that are being used to negotiate um, in this space? And to me, they should be kaupapa Māori principles, you know, from, from the get-go. What other principles would you use? 
um, you know, it, it should be mm. at the heart of um, this opportunity to do something that could be radically transformational. I think if, um, if all we do is tinker with the system and we don't cope up a Māori it, it won't be transformational. That, that's my simplistic view today. No, kapai. And, and I see that Lee put in takipu. And really, um, you know, when we think about takipu and the work by Taina in terms of uh, those notions within takipu, they kind of sit under that wider umbrella of taonga tukuiho. So they are kind of incorporated in a kaipa of a Māori uh, approach as well. And I guess what we're kind of seeing too in that question is that a reminder that crown structures, when they are shifting and changing, that the crown is not able to take ownership and, and doesn't can't take ownership of Kaibaba Māori. And therefore, we are looking at a meaningful tertiary relationship where we, uh, including these organisations, organizations have tino rangatiratanga in terms of our operation and the crown is very clear about its kawanatanga structure so i guess we need to get those sorted too in terms of when we're looking at these kinds of changes and systems uh, and a reminder that as you said linda it's not only about tinkering and it's not as we're seeing with some ministries like the ministry for children this notion of subcontracting somehow being some kind of meaningful relationship so it was um uh, that was an excellent question Kilda. Um, so from Marjorie Lipsham, tēnā koe, uh, ngā te dede ahu, mai katoa mani o poto. Uh, the question, in terms of the word trauma, did the research talk about kupu Māori that aligned to trauma uh, other than he oranga ngāko, and what, what were they? So what are some examples of that? And there's a follow-up question too from her on that around how the name he oranga ngāko came about for the project. There, there were names. The names came from our participants, but also from the literature review. So, you know, Taina Pohatu, I think, used the term Modi Moi. And, you know, there, there's a kind of whole vocabulary for talking about Podi, Podi Tanga, you know. So, yes, there were a lot of Maori terms. And to be honest, I can't actually remember of the exact moment we thought he oranga ngako but of course it came through in the design of um the proposal so then you're looking at the creator of the title and that's uh leone yeah i guess i can um, add to that too so in the report that we've sent through um there's a section uh, in terms of maori views of trauma and how we understand it so there are you know tiny notions around um as under saying maori moi but also, you know, how we come out of that was, well, oh, sorry, Modi Moi, Modi Noho, and then how we come out of that was um, Modi Oho, those kind of notions um, that are really important to the work. Um, and also Takiri Rangi and others, Takiri Rangi Smith talked about, um, you know, different ways in which we understand Podi and different layers and levels of Podi, and that Podi is connected to Marama. And so all through that, and there are a number of money providers that use those kind of philosophies around that kind of spectrum of understanding of well-being. Um, Patungako was another one uh, that he used quite significantly around trauma. And I guess the title Hiwangako came when we were talking as a group, really, about well-being. And, you know, of course, Hiwanga being well-being and taking that notion um, of patungako being trauma, and so he oranga ngako. And, and again, like he waka eke noa, these are whakatauki and whakatauaki that are used a lot by our people and um, that we know the understanding that kind of comes with them. So kia ora, uh, I want to move on to Miriaina, tēnā koe waikato tainui. Um, is the research being used and implemented by any of our government departments, for example, the Department of Corrections or ACC? I don't know. Uh, you know, I know people um, who work in those organisations uh, have access to the report and we have given seminars and we have uh, invited some policy people to you know our, our thought space wānanga to to have them engage in 
this work. I mean, one of the challenges of um, getting policy workers to take up research, you know, is that they often don't understand the practice challenges. So there's often a disconnect between the research, policy and practice. And what we've really tried to do in our projects is build in practitioners, providers, researchers, and policy people who understand policy. So that is part of our methodologies is to try and um, enhance the, the chances that the research will be applied uh, both up the power uh, line and down the power line. And so we do know it's influenced uh, practice and providers, and we do know policy people are reading and have access to that, but I can't tell you whether it's reflected in policy. I think um, one of the other things that we've done um, in the project and in other projects is uh, provide briefing papers to the various ministers and at the end of last year had a quite um, a significant conversation with Marlama Davidson and her field have also sent it to um, in terms of MSD and others and so people have you know we've been having these conversations but we've also you know uh, Māori healers and practitioners have been having this for a very long time really we're just kind of providing some support right to the ways in which Māori organizations uh, have been really challenging back because one of the things Linda, that came out too right was the barriers to kind of Māori uh, in terms of what is happening and I guess this is one uh, apartheid from Tracy uh, one around um, starting you know how do we start to advocate our clinical notes be formatted in a way that's ticker for whānau and um, not and don't have such a tight requirement around how they should look uh, but also I think raises the issue around barriers for holistic and punal kaupapa Māori practice. So I guess some kind of comment on that. Yeah. I mean, the, the case notes thing is interesting, eh? Because in a highly distributed sort of service provision um, system, I mean, the case notes are often owned by the provider. Uh, <clears throat> and, but there are professional practitioners who who are trained to write case notes in particular ways and to me that is an issue that at the practitioner level and at the provider level needs a discussion because it's one of the most taken for granted things that often happen you know people often talk focus about big system change and they overlook some real basic practices because everybody believes those, not that they're good, but that's just what you do. It becomes part of the wallpaper. And then we, you know, we don't see it in order to question it. So I think those that's an important conversation. That came up in Hui, that issue around case notes. And I remember um, the instant, you know, when somebody said something and it just clicked me on. But to be honest, if they hadn't said it, I would have been like everybody else and, and not really paid attention to it. I guess that's the power of having the regional hui approach that we integrate into all of the projects is that there's these open hui for anyone who wants to come in and just have a conversation around these kaupapa and they've worked really well to make sure we get a really good you know, spread of particularly people working in the field, but also whānau that come. Um, and so uh, um, Tani has asked a question around uh, education, and I guess this is kind of our background, really, Māori education. And so given that many uh, kaiako uh, within kura and other schools are not trained in trauma, uh, or not trained in kind of recognising maybe what's happening for some of our tamariki, um, how can we support kaiako uh, to recognize and be responsive to Tamariki Māori and whānau who experience trauma. And I, I, and I guess kind of alongside that, Linda, is that really also picks up a bit of Graham's ke piki or te kāinga, both economically and culturally as a principle. So if you've got a yeah. comment so on that. I, I find that interesting because there are what they call resource teachers of learning behaviour. Um, 
who whose role is to you know uh work with um learners who 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 have trauma and, and to pay attention and to think about strategies for them and i did speak to a group of maori ones uh who are like hungry for this sort of resource but that's not how they're trained uh they're trained i think in a particular psychological model and they're locked into that um and it's really difficult i mean this is the challenge for those of us working in kaupapa maori is the barriers to a lot of um, what we're suggesting. They're not right up in the government. That's not with the barriers. The barrier is in paradigms that are held by professional groups, by teacher education, um, lecturers who work in this area and that area, by particular disciplines, uh, by particular individuals. So there are multiple barriers. Um, you know, so many of our students and teacher ed can't even raise these questions because they're shut down, you know, it doesn't fit the curriculum. So it is a challenge um, getting through these barriers. And I think, you know, for you may not be as a kaiako trained in trauma, but as a kaiako Māori, you have a resource in you and your real and in your knowledge that gives you something, gives you a real to think about the healing part of it, gives you a sort of a model, philosophical, matauranga based model that helps you frame, you know, some solutions and some strategies. So look inwards if there's no support coming outwards from outwards i guess it uh, leads us on to another part time which is there's no name on this one but um what does a practitioner need as a foundation in order to practice couple of my approaches this kind of dovetails into what you've just been saying in terms of the family violence and sexual violence um sector more particularly do you have to speak to the Māori or have a sense of belonging to your iwi hapu and whānau before you can practice kaupapa Māori approaches <laughs> yeah yeah i mean look there's no neat path in our world to anything you know some people land on their feet well great they've got everything and you know they've got identity and they've got real and they've got you know all these sort of wonderful things but that's not the reality of a lot of maori for a lot of maori um it's a struggle to get to where the spaces we're in um and to kind of understand those and have the opportunities to learn and flourish in them so i'm not a person who kind of believes in pure models and purity I'm not a person who expects purity of identity um, or that if you've got this element of Māori, you're, you are more Māori than that person. I don't buy into any of that because, you know, hell, it's hard being a Māori. You know, it's, it's way better now than it was in our parents' era and it was in the era before. It's hard. And I think we all have to go on this journey. You might have fluent te reo, mm. but you may not have the critical analysis, the understanding of colonization, the experiences and working in these tough places. And I think in the family sexual violence space, you know, a lot of the practitioners in these spaces, um, you know, they're there because they've come out of those spaces and they've recovered from those spaces and they're committed to preventing others falling into um, those spaces. So, yeah, I don't think there's, if, if you want to work in that space, then that's the journey that you take. I think that aligns too to Graham's model of praxis that in terms of you know, in terms of Kaupapa of Māori, we're kind of able to enter in at different places and reflect and learn and grow and develop. 
and bring new skills and new understandings and then reflect and grow and develop as well similarly you know so there's lots of entry points I mean, we do know that there are certain things within Kaupapa Māori and within Ngātauranga Māori knowledge that gives us more strength and in, in, in understanding certain things. And so it is a journey, and it's a journey to... Get... I guess one of the things that we say in terms of Kaupapa Māori is that we may... There, there are always levels of te reo, but, the, but what we have in Graham's work is that we, we affirm, we validate, and we have a commitment to te reo, you know? And so, and that's a part of that journey and so then as we're moving along the fluency level then we you know we add more to our kete to ngā kete o te mātauranga as we as we do that and we move through things and so um, the commitment to te reo, the commitment to tikanga, the commitment to mātauranga, the commitment to always kind of learning and developing in our own frame and then in a wider way once we're in terms of general Kind of understanding as Māori, then it's coming into our iwi understandings, our hapu understandings, all those things. So I thought, you know, that's a really, um, it was a really excellent answer. Uh, the part I around, which kind of follows on from the Kopaba Māori uh, space too, in terms of trauma, do you see that there are alignments with other Indigenous nations in terms of how we are uh, engaging with trauma? You talked a little bit about Bonnie's work and Eduardo and Karina. Tessa. So what kind of um, engagement alignment do you see that we have with other Indigenous nations, given your extensive relationships that you have? There's a lot for us to learn from um, working in collaboration with other Indigenous communities. I mean, the trauma work in particular has is, uh, got maybe more traction in North America, more recognition. And there are some very powerful reasons why that is the case. And I'm always intrigued by indigenous responses to things, you know, and, and that includes our responses because they're often um, out of the box in a way. They're, they're often creative. They are like, for example, people might say, um, you know, how do we heal from, for example, these long uh, journeys and forced marches and walks that Native American um, tribes were forced to go on. They were forced to leave their lands on the east coast of the US and walk to Oklahoma where they were given, put on a reservation. You might think, you know, how do you heal from that huge trauma? And so a group of women, Karina, they decide their way to do that is to go and walk it. They go each year, I think, and they walk part of that journey. They walk the journey of their ancestors. And that to them was a healing process. Along the walk, they learnt things and came to appreciate the um, survivance, the resilience, the strength, the resistance, the love that their ancestors left for them to appreciate. So, you know, sometimes you think healing is about giving a, a specific rungoa, but it's also acting, doing things. Political action is healing. You know, sometimes talking back to power, that's healing. Um, and then sometimes peace, sitting by ourselves and reflecting is also healing. I'm really cognizant of the, um, even though I don't want us to be coming off, we, we do have the webinar at um, closes down on us in about six minutes. Uh, and so um, there, there are a couple of questions that I can probably just answer very quickly. Uh, one from Cindy, uh, in terms of the briefing with Marlima Davidson, the question was, um, you know, how successful was that given that Te Huda has been launched? We're, we're still in conversation with uh, Marlima 
around and really our thing was really to kind of brief her on what was um, happening and then to connect some of the other Māori providers and so it's not that we are following up with any kind of training or anything because it's not really our field as researchers it really is for the the practitioners in the Māori organizations um, to be doing that and Deb there were they asked about COVID Māori uh, delivery have we observed um, have there any short-term qualitative or longitudinal research that can validate what's going on? And there really hasn't, has there, Linda, at the moment? You, you did mean in Māori. terms of validating the healing part? Or oh, the hope of Māori delivery. Yeah. No. No. We want to do that. We do. And we have advocated to... We want to do that. <laughs> that we do that. Uh, for the last couple of years. So it's a really great question, Deb, and it's definitely something... Um, we know it works because we see that it works. Uh, yeah. But you're right in terms of delivery and our capacity to give evidence base. It's been very difficult to get any organisations to, um, in terms of the research granting organisations, to see that actually this is something that our people are asking for um, and would like to do. There is a quick question. We've got a couple of uh, minutes and we'll do this one last one. If we haven't answered your question, I'll... Um, try and get it noted and, and um, bring it up in the next webinar in two weeks' time. Um, and then we'll pass to uh, Hidi Aloha to close. But Luella uh, said, you mentioned old-time Māori strategies for ex exile. Were there also strategies or tikanga to integrate those in exile back into a community that would inform healing pathways, or was it permanent exile? It was probably both. I mean, I think some people were, actually some people were killed, to be frank. Yeah. Um, that was it. They were made dead. Um, and exile was a form of social death um, in that sense. But you, you know our culture, there are all kinds of processes and rituals that are restorative, that are about making peace, they're about inclusion. And you really only have to look, you don't even have to look that deep into our histories to show there was a great deal of movement. Um, you know, people were moving around. We weren't in these fixed um, sort of territorial boundaries as they're being defined at the moment, that there's a lot of evidence, you know, just through whakapapa, that people moved, our people moved in and out. There was a great deal of flow um there were there were definitely um there were definitely definitely fights and battles and wars if you like it um across hapu and iwi there's big stories about that um but there are also stories about long lasting peace i mean you, you don't you can't garden you can't establish the kind of gardens that Māori had without having peace and settlement. So, yes, there would have been strategies. Um, you, you know, and when we think about, if we all think about notions of utu and mudu, and, you know, mudu was a way of, of transforming a transgression uh, in a way that worked collectively, um, and ho hōhōdongo, which is what you're talking about at the end, Linda, in terms of the, you know, the ability to bring a peaceful uh, resolution to a particular um, kaupapa. Um, there is one question that I really think we do need to ask, and you've got like one minute, and that's oh. from Susan. Uh, when building new whānau of support, how do you see the relationship with the original whānau being healed so a positive connection be, can be transferred to the next generation? So it's intergenerational healing, really. Yeah, but it takes time, eh? And you and the person who's building their new fuddy really kind of has to get into that position. And and the other, the biological whānau, if you like, the whakapapa whānau have to recognise the growth that that person... I mean, I, I guess in a, a religious Christian sense, you would say the opportunity for redemption. Mm. And I think in a Māori sense, there's also that opportunity to prove that one can belong again in the collective. But I think, you know, that is a, um, that is a tough journey. But, um, you know, people do. They do reintegrate. No. 
and you know we have we have all of these terms you know whakataka you know those that, that really are about rebalancing and and correcting something um i just want to acknowledge you linda for your call today and thank you for opening the series we look forward to um you and i continuing this through the next few months every two weeks on a thursday at uh, 1 30 and uh kia koutou katoa i kuhu mai tēnā koutou tēnā koutou ka huri te kei o te waka ki a hiri anoha nā i, whak, uh, nā I, 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 I kati tēnei uh, āhotanga no reira tēnā koutou hiri anoha Nā tēnā korua aku mā rei korua o te mā pauranga tēnā rawa te korua ko te timana ko kua whai hua i roto i neo ngā korero anai a uh, tēnā katau kahuhi mai nei Hekitia, hekitia, hekitia te rongo mai piti o tēnei o ngā huinhinga tukua kia ia, tukua kia o i koramini ki ronga ko papatua nuki ki raro tūturu whakamaua kia tīna, hauni e huie, tāiki Ina tata.